Hello! This time I will be reading Chapter 6 of Part 4 of Crime and Punishment. The last chapter was a long interview between Porfiry Petrovich and Raskolnikov. Petrovich was talking away a lot and Raskolnikov was quite angry about the whole situation. Then at the very end of the chapter, at the chapter, it leaves us with a cliffhanger and I'm going to reread that little sentence that makes me want to dive right into Chapter 6. So at the end it says, but at this moment, a strange incident occurred, something so unexpected that neither Raskolnikov nor Porfiry Petrovich could have looked for such a conclusion to their interview. And that's where that ends. So now let's go straight to chapter six, which is the last chapter of part four. When he remembered the scene afterwards, this is how Raskolnikov saw it. The noise behind the door increased and suddenly the door was opened a little. What is it? cried Porfiry Petrovich, annoyed. Why, I gave orders. For an instant there was no answer, but it was evident that there were several persons at the door and that they were apparently pushing somebody back. What is it? Porfiry Petrovich repeated uneasily. The prisoner Nikolai has been brought, someone answered. He's not wanted. Take him away. Let him wait. What's he doing here? How irregular, cried Porfiry, rushing to the door. But he began the same voice and suddenly ceased. Two seconds, not more, were spent in actual struggle. Then someone gave a violent shove and the man, very pale, strode into the room. This man's appearance was at first sight very strange. He stared straight before him as though seeing nothing. There was a determined gleam in his eyes, and at the same time there was a deathly pallor in his face as though he were being led to the scaffold. His white lips were faintly twitching. He was dressed like a workman and was of medium, hei medium height, very young, slim, his hair cut in a round crop with thin spare features. The man whom he had thrust back followed him into the room and succeeded in seizing him by the shoulder. He was a warder. But Nikolai pulled his arm away. Several persons crowd inquisitively into the doorway. Some of them tried to get in. All this took place most instantaneously. Go away. It's too soon. Wait until you're sent for. Why have you brought him here so soon? Porfiry Petrovich muttered, extremely annoyed, and, as it were, thrown out of his reckoning. But Nikolai suddenly knelt down. What's the matter? cried Porfiry, surprised. I am guilty. Mine is the sin. I am the murderer. Nikolai articulated suddenly, rather breathless, but speaking fairly loudly. For ten seconds there was silence, as though all had been struck dumb. Even the warder stepped back, mechanically retreated to the door, and stood immovable. What is it? cried Porfiry Petrovich, recovering from his momentary stupefaction. I... I'm the murderer, repeated Nikolai after a brief pause. What? You? What? Whom did you kill? Porfiry Petrovich was ob obviously bewildered. Nikolai again was silent for a moment. Aliona Ivanovna and her sister, Lizavita Ivanovna, I killed with an axe. Darkness came over me, he said suddenly and was again silent. He still remained on his knees. Porfiry Petrovich stood for some moments as though meditating, but suddenly roused himself and waved back the uninvited spectators. They instantly vanished and closed the door. Then he looked toward Raskolnikov, who was standing in the corner, staring wildly at Nikolai, and moved towards him, but stopped short, looking from Nikolai to Raskolnikov, and then again to Nikolai, and seeming unable to restrain himself, darted at the ladder. You're in too great a hurry, he shouted at him almost angrily. I didn't ask you what, you what came over you. Speak, did you kill them? I am the murderer. I want to give evidence, Nikolai pronounced. Ah, what did you kill them with? An axe. I had it ready. Ah, he is in a hurry. Alone? Nikolai did not understand the question. Did you do it alone? Yes, alone. And Mitka is not guilty and had no share in it. Don't be in a hurry about Mitka. Ah, 
How was it you ran downstairs like that at the time? The porters met you both. It was to put them off the scent. I ran after Mitka, Nikolai replied hurriedly as though he had prepared the answer. I knew it, cried Porfiry with vexation. It is not his own tale he is telling, he muttered as though to himself, and suddenly his eyes rested on Raskolnikov again. He was apparently so taken up with Nikolai that for a moment he had forgotten Raskolnikov. He was a little taken aback. My dear Rodion Romanovich, excuse me, he flew up at him. This won't do. I'm afraid you must go. It is no good your staying. I will, you see, what a surprise. Goodbye. And taking him by the arm, he showed him to the door. I suppose you didn't expect it, said Raskolnikov, who, though he had not yet fully grasped the situation, had regained his courage. You did not expect it either, my friend. See how your hand is trembling. He <laughs> he. You're trembling too, poor Fury Petrovich. Yes, I am. I didn't expect it. They were already at the door. Porfiry was impatient for Raskolnikov to be gone. And your little surprise, aren't you going to show it to me? Raskolnikov said sarcastically. Why, his teeth are chattering as he asks. He <laughs> he, you are an ironical person. Come, till we meet. I believe we can say goodbye. That's in God's hands, muttered Porfiry with an unnatural smile. As he walked through the office, Raskolnikov noticed that many people were looking at him. Among them, he saw the two porters from the house, whom he had invited that night to the police station. They stood there waiting, but he was no sooner on the stairs than he heard the voice of Porfiry Petrovich behind him. Turning round, he saw the latter running after him out of breath. One word, Rodion Romanovich, as to all the rest, it is in God's hand, but as a matter of form, there are some questions I shall have to ask you, and so we shall meet again, shan't we? And Porfiry stood still, facing him with a smile. Shan't we? he asked again. He seemed to want to say something more, but could not speak. You must forgive me, Porfiry Petrovich, for what just passed. I lost my temper, began Raskolnikov, who had so far regained his courage that he felt irresistibly inclined to display his coolness. Don't mention it, don't mention it, Porfiry replied almost gleefully. I, myself, too, I have a wicked temper. I admit it, but we shall meet again, and if it's God's will, we may see a great deal of one another. And we'll get to know each other through and through, added Raskolnikov. Yes, know each other through and through, asserted Porfiry Petrovich, and he screwed up his eyes, looking earnestly at Raskolnikov. Now, you're going to a birthday party? to a funeral. Of course, the funeral. Take care of yourself and get well. I don't know what you what to wish you, said Raskolnikov, who had begun to descend the stairs, but looked back again. I should like to wish you success, but your office is such a comical one. Why comical? Porfiry Petrovich had turned to go, but he seemed to prick up his ears at this. Why, how you must have been torturing and harassing that poor Nikolai psychologically after your fashion till he confessed. You must have been at him day and night, proving to him that he was the murderer. And now that he has confessed, you'll begin vivisecting him again. You're lying. You'll say, you're not the murderer. You can't be. It's not your own tale you are telling. You must admit it's a comical business. He 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 he, you noticed then that I said that to Nikolai just now, that it was not his own tale he was telling. How could I not, how could I help notice? He he he, you are quit witted. You notice everything. You're really a playful, you really have a playful mind, and you always fasten on the comic side. He he he, they say that was the marked characteristic of Gogol among the writers. Yes, of Gogol. Yes, of Gogol. I shall look forward to meeting you. So shall I. Raskolnikov walked straight home. He was so muddled and bewildered that on getting home, he sat for a quarter of an hour on the sofa, trying to collect his thoughts. He did not attempt to think about Nikolai. He was stupefied. He felt that his confession was something inexplicable, amazing, something beyond his understanding. 
but Nikolai's confession was an actual fact. The consequences of that fact were clear to him at once. Its falsehood could not fail to be discovered, and then they would be after him again. Till then, at least, he was free, and he must do something for himself, for the danger was imminent. But how imminent? His position gradually became clear to him. Remembering sketchily the main outlines of his recent scene with Porfiry, he could not help shuddering again with horror. Of course, he did not yet know all Porfiry's aims. He could not see into all his calculations. But he had already partly shown his hand, and no one knew better than Raskolnikov how terrible Porfiry's lead had been for him. A little more, and he might have given himself away completely, circumstantially, knowing his nervous temperament and, from the first glance, seeing through him, Porfiry, Porfiry, though playing a bold game, was bound to win. There was no denying. The Raskolnikov had com compromised himself seriously, but no facts had come to light as yet. There is nothing positive. But he was taking a true view of the position. Wasn't he mistaken? What had Porfiry been trying to get at? Had he really some surprise prepared for him? And what was it? Had he really been expecting something or not? How would they have parted if they had not been for the unexpected appearance of Nikolai? Porfiry had shown almost all his cards, of course. He had risked something in showing them. And if he had really had anything up his sleeve, Raskolnikov reflected, he would have shown that too. What was that surprise? Was it a joke? Had he meant anything? Could it have been? Could he? It have concealed anything like a fact, a piece of positive evidence? His yesterday's visitor. What had become of him? Where was he today? If Porfiry really had any evidence, it must be connected with him. He sat on the sofa with his elbows on his knees and his face hidden in his hands. He was still shivering nervously. At last, he got up. He took his cap and he thought a minute. Then he went to the door. He had a sort of presentiment for today. At least, he might consider himself out of danger. He had a sudden sense almost of joy. He wanted to make haste to Katerina Ivanovna's. He would be too late for the funeral, of course, but he would be in time for the memorial dinner, and there at once he would see Sonia. He stood still, thought a moment, and a suffering smile came for a minute onto his lips. Today, today, he repeated to himself. Yes, today, so it must be. But as he was about to open the door, it began opening of itself. He started and moved back. The door opened gently and slowly, and there suddenly appeared a figure, yesterday's visitor from underground. The man stood in the doorway, looked at Raskolnikov without speaking, and took a step forward in the room. He was, he was exactly the same as yesterday, the same figure, the same dress, but there was a great change in his face. He looked dejected and sighed deeply. If he had only put his hand up to his cheek and leaned on his head on and leaned his head on one side, he would have looked exactly like a peasant woman. What do you want? asked Griskolnikov, numb with terror. The man was still silent, but suddenly he bowed down almost to the ground touching it with his finger. What is it? cried Raskolnikov. I have sinned, the man articulated softly. How? By evil thoughts. They looked at one another. I was vexed when you came, perhaps, and drink, and bade the porters go to the police station and asked about the blood. I was vexed that they let you go and took you for a drunken. I was so vexed that I lost my sleep. And remembering the address, we came here yesterday and asked for you. Who came? Raskolnikov interrupted, instantly beginning to recollect. I did. I've wronged you. Then you came from that house? I was standing at the gate with them, don't you remember? We have carried on our trade in that house for years past. We cure and prepare hides. We take work home. Most of all, I was vexed. 
and the whole scene of the day before yesterday in the gateway came clearly before Raskolnikov's mind. He recollected that there had been several people there besides the porters, women among them. He remembered one voice had suggested taking him straight to the police station. He could not recall the face of the speaker, and even now he did not recognize it. But he remembered that he had turned round and made him some answer. So this was the solution of yesterday's horror. The most awful thought was that he had been actually almost lost. He had almost done for himself on account of such a trivial circumstance. So this man could tell nothing except his asking about the flat and the blood stains. So Porfiry too had nothing but the delirium, no facts but his psychology, which, which cuts both ways. Nothing positive. So if no more facts came to life, and they must not, they must not, then, then what can they do to him? How can they convict him, even if they arrest him? And Porfiry then had only just heard about the flat and had not known about it before. Was it you who told Porfiry that I'd been there? He cried, struck by a sudden idea. What Porfiry? The head of the detective department. Yes, the porters did not go there, but I went. Today? I got there two minutes before you, and I heard, I heard it all. How he worried you. Where? What? When? Why, in the next room, I was sitting there all the time. What? Why, then you were the surprise, but how could it happen upon my word? I saw that the porters did not want to do what I said, began the man. For it's too late, they said, and maybe he'll be angry that we did not come at the time. I was vexed, and I lost my sleep, and I began making inquiries and finding out yesterday where to go. I went today. The first time I went, he wasn't there. When I came an hour later, he couldn't see me. I went the third time, and they showed me in. I informed him of everything, just as it happened, and he began skipping about the room and punching himself on the chest. What do you scoundrels mean by it? If I'd known about it, I should have arrested him. Then he ran out, calling somebody, and began talking to him in the corner. And then he turned to me, scolding and questioning me. He scolded me with a great deal, and I told him everything. And I told him that you didn't dare to say a word in answer to me yesterday, and that you didn't recognize me. And he fell to running about again, and he kept hitting himself on the chest and getting angry and running about. And when you were announced, he told me to go into the next room. Sit there a bit, he said. Don't move, whatever you may hear. And he set a chair there for me and locked me in. Perhaps, he said, I may call you. And when Nikolai's been through, he let me out as soon as you were gone. I shall send for you again and question you, he said. And he did question Nikolai while you were there. He got rid of me as he did you, and he spoke to Ni uh, before he spoke to Nikolai. The man stood still and again suddenly bowed down and touched the ground with his finger. Forgive me for my evil thoughts and my slander. May God forgive you, answered Raskolnikov. And as he said this, the man bowed down again, but not to the ground. So, and he turned slowly and went out of the room. It all cuts both ways. Now, it all cuts both ways, repeated Raskolnikov. And he went out more confident than ever. Now we'll make a fight for it, he said with a malicious smile. As he went down the stairs, his malice was aimed at himself. With shame and contempt, he recollected his cowardice. End of chapter 6, end of part 4.